уважаемый. Dear Vladimir Vladimirovich, dear ladies and gentlemen, allow me to start by welcoming on behalf of all participants of ABAC CEO Summit, Vladimir Vladimirovich, since all of you, of course, know who he is, I have to introduce him to the audience. Let me remind you that he was first elected president of Russian Federation in the year 2000. He served with great success two terms in office. Then he worked as prime minister of our country. And then in March this year, the general parliamentary general election, he won the first tour with the majority support of over two thirds of voters. Thus, Russian people gave him mandate to continue pursuing domestic and foreign policy of the Russian Federation. Vladimir Vladimirovich has great experience as participant of APAC summits since he participated in them more than once, and he was always very responsive. He always accepted to speak in front of the business community, just like today, Vladimir Vladimirovich. Let me inform you that we just held the first day of the CEO. Eight sessions have been held. Businessmen participated in them. We have here representatives of over 750 companies and corporations that represent all member states of the Asia-Pacific region. We also heard from prominent public figures, journalists, leaders of a number of economists that took part in panel discussions by Minister of New Zealand, President of Chile and Vietnam. But and we also appreciate very much your coming to speak in front of us. We spoke about advantages and difficulties that economic integration entails. And we all agreed, although there were many opinions, that integration is the only way forward for the development of global economy and that Russia, just like other countries, will continue moving along that road. We spoke about how many currencies the world needs. The general opinion was that the world is moving towards more currencies since new emerging economies develop in the Asia-Pacific region, and this process will weaken positions of the current reserve currencies such as dollar, US dollar, and will strengthen such currencies as Chinese yuan and Russian ruble. We also spoke about limited resources we have that we have to make good use of. We spoke about importance of innovation, new materials, new technologies that would help save the limited resources we have on this planet. We held this separate, very interesting discussion where we spoke about water, spoke about food, food security, spoke about need to enhance reliability of supply chains in Russia in particular, in the Far East of Russia. We spoke about prospects of developing distant areas, be that Far East of Russia, Alaska in the United States, or certain districts of China, Australia, how to better develop human capital in those distant regions. We spoke about infrastructures, basis for growth, public-private partnership. We covered a number of topics which are of concern and relevant to the international community. And of course, we want to hear from you about way forward for integration and various global processes, role Russia is going to play in the field. If I may, I suggest you speak from here, from this chair, to make it more friendly and open. And hopefully, it's going to be interactive. So I suggest I give the floor over to you. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. As I was getting ready for this meeting and certain bilateral meetings I already held on the margins of the APAC summit, I followed your discussions on the TV. I was admiring the courtesy of moderator. And I want to thank you 
example, the great job you did. The topics you were discussing are indeed of great relevance, very important. And this is precisely to discuss those issues that we have all gathered here. Engagement of business community in such fora. And for APEC, it has become a rule rather than an exception to bring together not only heads of states, governments, but representatives, or CEOs of major companies, representatives of business community. It has become a rule already. And we are seeing here a very good close connection, close ties between those that work with real politics and real economy. People meet, talk to each other, hear each other, discuss problems that both public authorities and business circles face. And I hope that during the today's discussion and in the following days, we would be able to find solutions or come up with proposals that would help foster development efficiently and would influence the development of global economy generally, and in particular, our regional economy. CEO Summit, like I said, is an integral part of the APEC Summit. APEC economy, you know for sure, but I'll just give you figures, generates over 55% of the global GDP, almost half of global trade, around 45% of all cumulative foreign direct investment in the world. But that is not the most important point. What is, you might ask? The most important thing is that Asia-Pacific region as a larger region, despite well-known complications in the global world economy for the past 20 years, has been growing at the quickest rate, increasing financial investment scientific and technological potential. The leading role implies shared responsibility. All the more it is important today that the global econ economic is fragile. We all know that in Asia-Pacific regions, there are also some alarming trends. Uh, reducing growth rate of economies of certain leading countries. But when growth rates slow down, it's one thing, but it's not what matters? The problem is that the trend is persistent. Nonetheless, the growth rate in the Asia-Pacific region is way ahead than in that of other advanced countries. Problems in banking sector and other spheres of economy had negative telling on the growth rate. Unfortunately, unemployment in advanced economies is also growing. Implications were felt by the majority of other states fluctuations on currency, monetary markets, and stagnation of demand became challenges to all economies with no exceptions. In-depth problems, unfortunately, still have not been resolved. So the situation and the problems might be protracted. There are nonetheless reasons for very cautious optimism key economic players are trying to play by the rules, if I may put it that way. They do not take irresponsible unilateral steps that might have unpredictable implications. And such fora is APEC contribute to that. Of course, we discussed that at the G8, G20 as well. But we also deal with them in APEC, so largely the success is a result of our common endeavors. At the top of the crisis, we managed to uh, avoid sliding into the impasse of blunt protectionism or trade wars. On the contrary, we opted for joint steps to overcome crisis, to continue reforming the system of financial regulation. The goals we're facing today, the challenges we're facing today, are probably even more difficult than we've had to face at the previous stages of the crisis. What we all need now are new approaches, new modalities of economic development. The global economic landscape is changing literally as we speak. In terms of growth rate, developing markets during the next two decades will be growing much faster than traditional advanced countries of the world. It is a fact of life for everyone. 
that will inevitably imply reorientation of flows of trade and finance. And this would be just one of many manifestations of the global transformation process. It is obvious that these processes are deeply rooted. The world is ushering in the new economical, technological, and geopolitical era. This transition will be long. It will be difficult. For many, it will be painful. Many conventional approaches will have to be revisited. So instead of statements, life will demand from us pragmatic, practical solutions. And I think it is no by chance that it is during the crisis trials, regional integration projects gave an, had got an impetus. This is a very positive phenomenon that offers very promising prospects, especially in light of the continuous difficulties within the WTO and the slippage of the Doha round of trade negotiations. We believe that regional integration based on understanding and taking into account each other's interests, interests of partners that are geographically close to us, could play the key role in upholstering fundamental principles of open market and free trade ensure dynamic development of the entire global economy. Moreover, dialogue between major regional structures, such as this forum, APAC, NAFTA, EU, or the recently created the post-Soviet space, single economic space, create solid bases to improve rules for global trade and investment. It's important to encourage global negotiation process and put forth initiative, initiatives from regions to start a bottom-up process to create expanded integration spaces, establish dialogue between regional and sub-regional unions and associations. It is in that direction in which Eurasian integration is developing with active participation of Russia, free trade area and the CIS. We recently signed and most CIS countries have ratified an FTA treaty and the CIS. The customs union, the single economic space I referred to earlier that was created, established by the three former Soviet states, Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan, became more than just our common response to the challenges of the crisis. They opened up new doors to implement joint projects with APEC economies. Negotiations on an FTA between the Customs Union and New Zealand are underway. We drafted a joint report on the possibility of launching similar negotiations with Vietnam. Negotiations on the same matter with other countries are also possible. We received dozens, I want to highlight dozens of requests from countries from Asia Pacific region that are seeking special treatment, special regimes with the customs union. Uh, that is, that comprises three countries I referred to earlier. By the way, here in Vladivostok, the forum, our country is guided by and act with respect to the consolidated position of the integration troika, Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. We're not standing still. Now already we're working on the establishment of the Eurasian Economic Union. This would mean an even greater stage of integration, and even more authorities and powers would be delegated to a supranational level. We'll be pursuing harmonized microeconomic, technological, and financial policy. Basically, we want to create a powerhouse of regional development. The future Eurasian Economic Union might become some sort of a link connecting Europe and the Asia Pacific region. I want to highlight specifically, it is exactly at this moment that it's vital to build bridges between different regions of the world. In that respect, I believe that one of our priority tasks is to make sure that global and regional markets remain open. We have paid too high price for the illusion of simple solutions. We can use protectionist measures as tools, as medicine. This would help alleviate acute symptoms, but it hampers the 
general recovery of global economy. It limits trade activity and investment. Let me remind you that in the heat of the crisis, the global trade contracted by 12 percent. It was in 2009. This is the unprecedented fall since the World War II. This, of course, are direct implications of the meltdown of financial markets, but it is also the price we're paying for the outburst of protectionist restrictions. At the end of the day, all of us had to pay the price. No one is trying to deny government's right to protect domestic markets or businesses. They must naturally protect those markets. And I know from my own experience, I can tell you how such decisions are taken. You know, Russia's done that, to be very frank with you. But when in 2009, as chairman of Russian government, I came to one of our enterprises in the, north, in the south of the country. They produce agricultural machinery. So I got into the factory and I could see that they have produced many equipment, that they find no buyers to sell to. And it means that the production has stopped. People are not being paid salary. Uh, people have no money to live in. And there's equipment everywhere. You know, it's impossible to pass on the premises. And you can't help thinking, what should we do? The first solution that comes into your hand, that pops to your hand, is to limit import, to protect domestic producers' interests. And we did have to take certain steps, because back then we were not yet members of the WTO, so we had the right to do so. And EU, by the way, did the same thing to protect a number of their own producers in the car industry in the first place. Maybe at certain stages, in certain situations, those steps would have be justified, because otherwise national economies and global economy would have suffered. But it's a different but there's a different question to ask ourselves. We need to have clear-cut, understandable rules. And because it would be wrong to formally, on paper, write one thing and do something completely different in real life. Understanding that in certain conditions, there's nothing else to be done. Once again, we need very clear-cut, easy-to-understand rules. So we need to dot all the I's and to agree on the acceptable level of protective measures that would help save jobs in the times of crisis. What matters most is trust and certainty in those matters. This is what we need to achieve. It is on the basis of this approach that Russia will continue working, in particular within the framework of the WTO. As full-fledged participants of the organization, we are ready to actively involve in drafting of fair rules of international trade. We believe we need to come up with special rules that would help countries support separate sectors of their economies that are most vulnerable, susceptible to global turbulences. Such measures would help us remedy deficiencies of the regulatory legal framework of the WTO itself would enhance credibility of the organization as a universal structure capable of finding efficient solution to the problems of global trade, respond to new challenges. I want to highlight, ladies and gentlemen, that Russia is in favor of promoting integration agenda of our forum, seeking further liberalization of trade and investment with respect to Bogor goals. For us, this is not merely a declaration. We're expanding our economic presence in the region. When Russia acceded to the WTO, we undertook a number of commitments which we're going to be honoring to reduce tariff and non-tariff restrictions. That said, we believe that preferential trade agreements, arrangements, must be as transparent as possible. This would help everyone see advantages and drawbacks of uh, effective free trade agreements and those that are yet being drafted and in the future create an optimal integration model. Trade, of course, is not the only thing that is in the focal point of our agenda. Energy security, environment, innovation are becoming more and more relevant. 
were engaging in active dialogue on intellectual property rights production. One of the top priorities would be the development of the transportation system of the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, in respect of the recommendation of the ABAC to diversify trade routes, we, together with single economic space partners, are ready to put on the table and offer to everyone geographic infrastructure capabilities of Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. If you look at the territories of the three countries, you shall see that we have something to offer. Our single economic space is free from any internal customs or other formalities, and that means we open doors to business circles from the Pacific region, not only into the economies of our countries in terms of economics and infrastructure, but would also create close ties with Europe. By the way, I already mentioned the establishment of the customs union and the single economic space. Let me highlight, because it is very important, both formats were set up and are functioning on the basis of the WTO principles. And I'm confident that it will help all of our economic partners, including those from the Asia-Pacific region, to be more confident when working on the markets of the three countries. To enhance our performance and reliability of supply chains, we need to use proactively advanced technologies, including space technologies. In that respect, Russia also has something to offer to our partners. For instance, transportation hubs and corridors could be equipped with a global positioning system, GLONASS. It took us rather short to create this system. Now it's truly global. We put on orbit 28 satellites, uh, two of which are backup satellites. It's fully operational and is used very efficiently. Another priority of Russia presidency in APAC is food security. Access to food is not a merely economic or social issue. It is a matter of future for millions of people. Uh, Yes, today, if I'm not mistaken, I heard someone, was it moderator, one of the participants of the first part of the meeting, that said that 150 million in this year alone started to face in food shortage. Some experts estimate that it's 200 people, over a billion people, suffer from hunger on the planet. So we cannot turn a blind eye to this important socioeconomic factor. Russia, like I said before, has contributed and will be contributing significantly to the stability of food supplies to Asia-Pacific markets in Australia. At this moment in time, our export potential is about 15, if not 20 million tons of grains, according to experts, by the year 2020, our country will be annually producing 122, 125 million tons of grains. This would mean that our export potential will grow to 35 or maybe even 40 million tons. That, of course, does not mean that we're going to limit ourselves to export of food only. It serves our common interest to encourage mutual investments in agriculture expand areas of sustainable agriculture, implement other agricultural projects using, naturally, advanced technologies. Uh, we're also con considering close cooperation in the sustainable use of bioresources, bioresources of the Pacific Ocean in particular, because all of our countries are located on the shores of Pacific and we're interested in sustainable use of our resources. Traditionally, we've been giving great attention to the regional energy cooperation, achieving sustainable balance of energy consumption in the region. Russia is one of the leading and reliable, I want to stress that, suppliers of energy resources is capable of playing one of the key roles. Over the past few years, we implemented a number of very important for the region projects. I'm referring to Sakhalin projects of oil production with some of the participants of the today's forum with our U.S. partners. We yesterday mentioned that, and I'm grateful to them for their high assessment of our joint work. Mr. Tillerson, CEO of Axon Marble, 
yesterday spoke about the implementation of Sahalin projects. So those are international projects. I want to highlight that specifically. So we'll continue working in that direction. We'll continue strengthening our cooperation with partners, work on energy security, not only energy security of Russia, but that of our partner countries in the region generally. Sufficient, safe, reliable energy resources is preconditioned for sustainable growth, both of global economy and the economy of the Asia-Pacific region. A separate topic is strengthening international cooperation in the field for peaceful use of nuclear power. We all know about the accident in the Fukushima. It became a very serious lesson for all of us. That's why uh, high robust construction and secure, secure ex operation of the nuclear power plants is the requirement which we're going to stick to right now. We're implementing a number of projects, including Asia. We're building power plants in the People's Republic of China. I'm pleased to know that our Chinese friends and partners are satisfied with the quality of the product presented and prepared by our nuclear machine building. Let me note that these projects are major international projects. We are not sticking to certain excessive incomes. We are trying to build relations with technological world, technological leaders in such a way that every component of these large-scale international projects involved leaders specializing in different areas. Around 30% of the project cost, these are costly projects amounting to billions of dollars, from two, three, up to eight billion dollars, each of the projects, I mean. Around 30 or 50% of this pro of uh, the income is given to subcontractors to implement these projects in the regions where these projects have been implemented. That's the approach behind the bilateral agreements concluded with our traditional partners. But security issues are at the forefront of our work. We talk about that, we agree on that, and we develop our work with the friends in Japan, US, and Australia, as well as some other states. We will stick to these principles in the future. Russia is advocating the creation of the regional system for monitoring man-made and natural disasters. Here, again, we are ready for the closest possible cooperation with our partners in the APEC region. Speaking about energy, one cannot but touch upon such an important issue as energy saving and rational use of energy sources, reducing resource intensity of the GDP. Such a model of so-called green growth opens up doors for a new technological order. I'm convinced that the APEC forum will serve for uniting efforts of economists in addressing key energy issues, and regional business will invest in the development and intake of technologies which will increase energy security of the whole region. An important integration area in the implementation of which we count on active cooperation with the business communities is innovation. I have touched upon this topic here in the Far East Federal University. Let me uh, pay attention to scientific and educational cooperation, the importance of this topic. And our interest is to uh, multiply links with universities, research centers, and scientific organizations to promote student exchanges, contacts between academia. It all contributes to the development of the human capital. A very important step in this direction is the agreement on gradual creation of common educational space achieved this year in the APEC region. APEC economists complement the efforts of each other in scientific and base staff and educational, human and educational potential. Our prosperity, it goes without saying, depends to most to great extent on the capabilities. Based on these competitive advantages, we will be able to ensure the new quality of economic growth in the region. This year, with the support of the ABEC, partnership 
political partnership on innovations and technology was established. We held a dialogue on promising technological issues. Their goal is to engage business in the discussion of conditions for creating market-driven, conducive to innovation development in, in de development environment. I believe it is a very fruitful and promising undertaking. We should take into account the opinion of business and will continue to do so in the future. And of course, we should respect the interests of best business. And we hope that business will uh, send specific uh, concrete requests to the uh, scientific community. Dear colleagues, Russia is an indispensable part of the Asia-Pacific region. We invest a lot into the development of Siberia and Far East. Now. We are, and we, we are working and we will continue working at the facilities or premises of the of Far East Federal University. It's a large-scale project aimed at creating a new scientific, educational and intellectual center in the Far East of Russia. It uh, has, was implemented over around three years. It is a huge work for us and we think that it's a great beginning in the way of restoration of science, and as I have mentioned it already, the establishment of an intellectual powerhouse here, and we will move forward um, in this direction in the future. Our traditional theme of the EPEC is EPEC means business. Traditionally, in Russian language, business has two meanings, entrepreneurship and action. And I would like to wish all of us to be action-oriented, focused, courageous and visionary to work and to determine the nature of our joint work. We should set ambitious goals. We should move forward, responding to the challenges of time. And it goes without saying that this is the prerequisite of our joint successes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Vladimir Vladimirovich, I think that lots of statements have been mentioned which could give rise to questions, and I would ask the audience to use the opportunities to ask questions. And as while you're thinking, let me use my right as an moderator and ask my own question resulted from talking to Vladimir Vladimirovich. Many businessmen present here have visited Russia more than once, but they have mostly visited Moscow. That's the first time they're visiting Vladivostok, and the impressions that I've heard are that the nature is very beautiful, people are very hospitable, but even if we compare this region to the eastern part of Russia or other parts of the Asia-Pacific region, uh, the infrastructure is less developed and industry is underdeveloped as well. But the question is to you, as a president of Russia, what do you think, what measures could be taken to develop in the future so, so that when Russia has the right to host this summit once again on the territory of Russia and it will happen not uh, earlier than in 10 or 15 years, uh, what would you do so that Russian businessmen could say when they visit us again that Russia is the most advanced country with the most developed economy in the Asia Pacific region? So, how do th what do you think how this process could be implemented in the near future? You know, it is not a coincidence that one of my colleagues today said that more than 50 percent of trade turnover in Russia is with European countries. There is certain share with United States, Northern America, but as for the APR, Asia Pacific region, this share is much smaller, although this region is developing very rapidly. It has to do with the different reasons. First and foremost, due to the fact that during Tsar and Soviet times, Russia paid attention to developing Far East. But it was not that active in developing this region as it should have been. As far as Vladivostok goes, this city was closed. It is a, the base of the naval fleet, and it was closed. And 
not much was developing here in reality. The new Russia, the modern Russia, will be behaving differently. First of all, we will try to at the fastest possible raise to develop infrastructure. There's nothing new that I could say to the Russian citizens, but probably it would be interesting for our foreign guests to find out that before the beginning of the 20th century, Russia was developing its territories in such a way that only in winter was possible to get to Vladivostok by land when it was possible to go there by roads, whereas uh, during summer, the only possible way was the Indian Ocean. There were no roads there. The first railway appeared by 1904. It was the Trans-Siberian Railroad. The second road appeared in the 80s. It's Baikal Amur main road, main line. There were no roads. There were no motorways for cars. There was not a single road that could connect the European and Asian parts of Russia. In the 60s, it was started to be constructed. Then this process in the 80s was suspended. And only not long ago, we started developing this process at uh, fast rates and completed this work. But it's not enough. That's why the first thing we should do is to develop the transport infrastructure, cars, railway transportation and aviation. Then, not in terms of meaningfulness, but in terms of order, we should develop intellectual activities. Here in the Amor region, we are going to establish the second space field eastern for the Russian citizens. The first works on creating and designing uh, this launch pad have begun. We are going to start commercial launches here in the interest of the Russian Federation as well as in the interests of our partners. As you know, Russia is making more than any country launches of missiles in the world. And that spot, that launch pad, will be the second place here. And thus, we are going to establish and develop intellectual powerhouses here. And the place we are present today is one of such places. And it's not a coincidence that we are hosting and we are organizing this event in Vladivostok. At the host country, we could organize this event in any uh, part of Russia, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, in Ekaterinburg, in the Urals region. But we decided to do that here so that to give impetus to the development of this region. There are certain conventional issues. Let's say in Komsomolsk on Amur, in the east, one of the largest aviation enterprises uh, is uh, located where our combat aircrafts Suhoi are being manufactured. It's one of the famous enterprises. There are some other areas, let's say fishing, where we're uh, cooperating with our partners in the from the EPIC region with Japan, Korea, United States, and of course energy sector. We're going to develop it at the proactive rates let me pay your attention to the fact that European and Eastern energy systems of Russia, in the same way as railroad systems, have not, have not been uh, connected yet. We are going to develop the energy sector in the Far East and we are going to connect to the grids of the European part so that we could facilitate the transfer of energy resources and electricity from one part to another and to easily access uh, European and Asia-Pacific region markets. We hope, and actually the work has started, if we judge by the progress in Sakhalin, the great area of work has opened up for attracting everybody who is interested in the development of this region and really hope that events such as APEC Summit will contribute to developing business in innovative and investment uh, cooperation in all the er regions of the world, including the Far East. Thank you very much. I hope that uh, most of you will be interested in this. Uh, colleagues, now you are welcome to ask your questions. So please introduce yourself clearly. So that. 
You have emphasized that the economic growth and development of the region are very important. They require lots of financial resources, so they sound uh, financial system. What measures are to be taken to maintain the development of these programs? Thank you. Mr. Coston has mentioned the development of our world financial system, the global currencies, and our moderator today spoke about new possible uh, the appearance of new reserve currencies, and this process is actually developing. We hear more and more about Canadian dollar, the Australian dollar, about yuan, which is getting stronger and stronger. Indeed, the ruble could be the reserve currency as well, because it is used more often at the post-Soviet space in different transactions. And participants of the business community use rubles in 60% of times between different uh, countries of uh, the post-Soviet area. We all understand that it is not enough to undertake only administrative measures by the government to strengthen the financial system, the financial currency, to make it more stable. It is important to carry out a well-thought macroeconomic policy to ensure stable sustainable and advancing economic development to ensure confident economic growth rates. Understanding that, we put macroeconomic stability at the forefront of our economic policy. Let me pay your attention, dear colleague, to the fact that on the whole, we are coping with this task recently. Over the last years, around seven years ago, our inflation accounted to 13, 14 percent. Last year, this, the rate was quite high compared to the advanced economies, but it was an unprecedented low indicator over the last 20 years, 6.1 percent. We are going uh, to maintain the rate of inflation at this very stage or to make it even lower. I don't know how the government will be able to cope this year, but we are going to stick to these uh, levels. The Russian Federation has the lowest foreign debt compared to all advanced economies. If we could assess the indebtedness of Russia at the level of 10%, we can say that foreign debt of Russia count only for 2.5%. Um, this figure could rise, the, our foreign debt could rise, but in general we'll try to stick to, the, to quite low levels. As for such an important indicator, as I have mentioned, here I mean social questions, but again they have to do with other areas, and it is unemployment that has an impact on macroeconomic indicators. We have the lowest indicator, uh, which is 5.1%. It is the lowest indicator over the last decades. It all together, as well as sound balance of expenditures and incomes of the budget, will be maintained, and I really hope that it will bear fruit so that we could say that the financial system of Russia is sustainable, that we will strengthen banking system. As you know, during crisis, the first thing we did was support financial sector. I know we were criticized for that, not only domestically, but abroad as well. But I believe that was a step in the right direction. We all know very well that financial system is a cardiovascular system of the economy. Without this system, the economy would just collapse. So we're going to continue strengthening the financial sector. 
will be consolidating banks, would not make any hasty actions, we would not be requiring too much or demanding too much, we would not force any mergers or acquisitions, but consolidating is what we're going to do. And of course, we'll stick to the main principle, free flow of capital. Even during financial crisis of the year 2008, 9, and early 10, we did not impose any restrictions on the export of capital. We did lose some of the resources, indeed, but they are coming back now. And I think that this principal position on free flow and the export of capital made the return of capital possible eventually. In terms of golden currency reserves, Russia is one of global leaders. We have 515 to 520 billion dollars golden currency reserves, and then we have two reserve funds, National Wealth Welfare Fund, 80 billion dollars, and Government Reserve Fund, 60 billion US dollars. So the overall volume of reserves we have in this country is substantial and sufficient to timely respond to any financial market turbulences. Thank you, Vladimir Vladimirovich, for the kind words in respect of the Russian banking sector. By the way, we in VTB would be only too happy to change your dollars to Russian rubles and vice versa. Of course, we need to broader use regional currencies. We signed agreements between our banks and Chinese banks, and we do uh, trade settlements in Russia, UN, and we agree on similar arrangements with other partners. That would definitely help strengthen the global system. Next question, please. Hello. My name is Chen Maochen from the Chinese delegation. First of all, I'd like to congratulate President Putin on his recent re-election to, to the presidency. But just now, we were very impressed by this brilliant insight, and certainly from the Chinese corporate perspective, we recognize the desire to develop economies, maintain stability, and as we are faced with future development and globalization, Chinese enterprises are eager to invest in Russia. Uh, we know the especially the Far Eastern Federal University here in Vladivostok is uh, active in the areas of critical emerging industries such as new energies. Now, Chinese delegation has come uh, to Russia to, un to learn about new investment opportunities. We are interested in hearing about what policies are in place in Russia in regards to uh, the environment and new energy sectors. In the investment environment in Russia, the investment environment in Russia. Well, you already know many things. We have great volume of trade with China. Last year, we had a record of 83.5 billion dollars, and I expect the volume of trade between Russia and China to approach 100 billion per annum. Just for your comparison, the second largest trading partner it's Germany, and they generate 50-something billion. United States, which is another APAC economy, by the way, we only have 34 billion of trade. So we understand that this is not enough. But in case of China, 100 billion, we're going to reach that target very soon. I have no doubt about that. Last year, we had an increase of volume of trade at 42 percent, 
And this year, January to June, almost 14 growth, 14 percent growth. Talking about investment, this is a very important area of our interaction. We've established Russian Fund for Direct Investment, and the leading Chinese investment company is participating directly in the work of the fund. I know that the volume of resources that the Chinese investment company has to offer is substantial. So right now, together with our partners, who are seeking ways and areas in which those resources could be used. There are some traditional fields, of course. One of them is energy. Today, I already had a meeting with Hu Tao, a great friend of our country and my personal friend. So we discussed in great detail and by the way, what's very specific, uh, what's very characteristic of, of Chinese leadership is that they like details. So we discussed in great detail what has been done and what can be done. So in case of high technologies and energy, we need to expand nuclear cooperation. We are already building, we have built already a number of uh, nuclear power plants in China. And we hope that our experts will get a chance to continue this work. We already have certain arrangements. On the other hand, we know that Chinese partners are interested in developing cooperation in hydrocarbons. So we mean gas, oil supplies, liquefaction of gas. Everything's possible. Active negotiations are underway. So we are working, we are supplying hydrocarbons, oil in particular. We are discussing possible gas supplies. And at the same time, we are proactively discussing potential for future cooperation. I hope in the next future we are going to continue discussion on tending oil process and factory and oil and chemical complex. We know that partners are interested in cooperation in such fields is aviation and space. We have great plans to create heavy helicopter together and broad wing airplane. To a large extent, this work cannot be efficient without public support and involvement. But I want to draw your attention to the fact that private capital or equity capital from China would also fit well, fit well in the arrangement. So when we talk about new aviation projects such as heavy helicopter, could be interesting for business since it might have good commercial applications. Other potential co potential for cooperation is there. There are many fields. The cooperation is well diversified. I mean, textile industry, we would be greatly interested in seeing textile production facilities created not only in China but in Russia as well. We know that Chinese textile products hold great share of the market in Russia in particular. We are ready to cooperate in agriculture. We see good prospects not only in border regions but also global, more general cooperation. Producing cars, carriages, because we have many such products coming to our market from China. We need to agree and elaborate common quality standards. We have a great volume of work to do together. And I'm confident that with administrative, political support from both sides, we shall succeed. Colleagues, more questions, please. Maxim Ananyev, город Владивосток. Maxim Ananyev, Vladivostok. Vladimir Vladimirovich, I'm a car owner. As such, I want to thank you for the new bridges. We needed them badly as citizens of the city. My question is as follows. 
Are there going to be any changes of funding of our region after the summit? Is it going to shrink dramatically? It took Vladivostok citizens to wait for the bridges since 1903. They've been waiting for the new bridges since 1903. The first po postcards with the image of the bridge across the Golden Horn Bay were published in 1903, if I'm not mistaken. And this wasn't a real bridge. It was an imaginary bridge. People were dreaming of it back then. And only now were we able to finally build it. You know, it takes us a while in Russia to implement projects. But you know, it's slow but steady. The second bridge across the Bosphorus East Strait, it's the largest in terms of the flight span, the, pardon, the bridge span. So we had to use the new, the cutting edge technology. We have satellite systems monitoring in real time the condition of the bridge. And I sincerely hope it's going to function properly the way it is supposed to, the way designers wanted it to work. As regards the attention and support of the Far East and Primorsky Krai, Primorsky region, I mentioned that in my previous in answers to previous questions. I believe, I'm confident that this is one of the top priorities for the Russian Federation for the years to come, developing Eastern territories and regions not just because it is of great importance for our country, but also because economic center of gravity is shifting towards this region. So if we want to be efficient, and we do want to be efficient, we need to develop infrastructure in the region. So we need to make sure we can guarantee efficient flow of people and cargo in the region. Over the past few years, we managed to substantially, I want to highlight that specifically, substantially increased throughput of transportation infrastructure in the Far East. But the railroad is not capable of coping with the growing volume of shipments. Trans-Siberian Railroad at this moment is shipping more cargoes than in record years of the Soviet Union, when the entire Soviet Union was shipping stuff. Today, Trans-Siberian Railroad has the higher throughput than in the top, in the peak Soviet years, and it still isn't enough. So we have to do it, and we will do it. Do you know what? Energy potential is huge. Like I said before, the European part of Russia, energy grids of the European and Asian parts of Russia were never interconnected physically. So, and this is a fact of life, unfortunately, energy is more expensive than in the European part of Russia. The rates are higher, and that hampers economic development. Living is more expensive, and it results in outflow of people from the region because they choose to live in regions where it's cheaper and infrastructure is better developed. So this is one of our priorities, developing energy, creating links with the European part of Russia. So we'll be producing more gas, oil, mineral resources. I came here from the north of Russia, which is also in the eastern half, the eastern Siberia. In the Yamala Peninsula alone, uh, the explored volume of gas is 55 trillion of cubic meters. It's a global scale. And look at the treachery. It's really small. The region is small. You can walk from one part of it to another on foot, not to mention uh, the potential of ores in the Irkutsk region. The deposits are huge. In Sakhalin, we're just starting, you were just starting to get Sakhalin gas, gas from Sakhalin. I'm, ref I'm of course, telling that to you that live in Vladivostok. And that's just first of many steps. And I sincerely hope that people will feel the difference, that will stabilize the population level here. Maybe people will start moving here. 
in some parts of the region where active works are underway, people are starting to come. But we have huge potential to develop hydro energy. We need to be very serious about protecting the environment, especially when developing hydro power plants. And we shall do so. Oh, by the way, about resources and funding. You understand that we built the center in just three years. We did it purposefully. It wasn't just to construct a few buildings or premises or five-star hotels to host my fellow heads of states and government in luxury. But this is nothing new to colleagues. They know what luxury is. It's not what matters. What matters is atmosphere, business environment. That's what matters. I've known many of them for many years. So we decided to do it differently. We invested hundreds of billions to develop Ruski Island, to develop infrastructure, create new science and education center for the Far East. And then after the end of the summit, the entire, all the premises will be given to the university for future generations to use. I think it is a right decision. Of course, we would not be able to invest similar amounts to create additional centers, and this isn't viable. But when we're going to be building Vostochny launch pad in the Mursk region, we'll be developing transportation, airfields, developing aviation in general, we'll be developing fisheries. But there are many problems. I do not want to dwell on that, but we will work on that persistently. Mr. Sachin would like to ask a question. It's been a long time, Igor Ivanovich. If I may, as a host, today it's Mr. Sachin's birthday, so I would like to congratulate him on behalf of all of us, wish him every success, happiness, all the best. Thank you very much, Vladimir Vladimirovich, colleagues. The government of Russian Federation in April this year issued a decree. You signed it on April 12th. The number of the decree is 443. Measures of economic support, major investment projects on shelf when producing hydrocarbons in difficult environmental, adverse environmental conditions. Can we hope that Asia-Pacific region leaders would consider reducing import or other duties for products or raw materials that will be produced during those projects that are supplied to those countries? So raw materials that are supplied to those countries. Because we believe this solution could help reduce risks for private investors, would create more opportunities to promote their products, provided those funds are reinvested into the new project. Because on the one hand, Russia undertakes commitment to subsidize bringing those products to Asia-Pacific markets. So a step in our direction to reduce import duties to support the projects could be very beneficial. Thank you. First of all, that's the question to the leaders of our partners. I cannot say whether they are going uh, to, to reduce import duties or not. But on the whole, when we're speaking about creating the common market, single market, the free trade area, because at the beginning of the, when the APEC forum was established, the supreme goal was set to create the free market. And I hope that we will we are going to move in that direction. Hope that the conditions of mutual trade will improve. I have no doubts in that. You already know that today at the bilateral meeting, the leader of the People's Republic of China told us that the joint venture in Tanzin will be authorized to buy oil products and export and sell these products as well as sell it at the domestic market of China. That happens for the first time in China that such a decision is taken with participation, with foreign participation. Here I mean participation of Russia. That's a step forward in the, in the area of trade globalization and improving the trade environment. I really hope that similar decisions will be 
made in other countries, including tariff and non-tariff regulation. Co colleague in the third row, please. Uh, I'm from a, a business from uh, Beijing, China. First of all, congratulations uh, on uh, Russia's joining of uh, WTO. My question is uh, for Chinese companies, they really would like to invest in Russia. And China-Russian uh, trades uh, are developing really fast. As we, it is well known that uh, Mr. President has taken huge measures to encourage the investments. But what about the legal framework? How can we uh, guarantee the uh, safety of the Chinese business investing in Russia and how the government efficiency could be improved in order to protect the uh, foreign investors, especially from China? Thank you very much. I think it's one of the fundamental issues. Investment protection is the major prerequisite for creating a sound investment climate. Let me inform you that we are consistently working on improving investment climate, investment environment. I personally believe, and the government of the Russian Federation is moving in that direction, that this task is the priority for us. The aspiration to attract investment is one of the priorities in our economic policy. And first and foremost, I mean here private investment, private resources, resources from the stakeholders. Many Chinese companies have these resources, and we are aware of that. So let me reiterate it. That's one of our priorities. We developed the special program, so say roadmap, investment environment improvement in the Russian Federation. Let me know that we were working on this roadmap in, with participation of the business community of Russia, taking into account their recommendations. I'm not going to go into details, but we are setting a very ambitious goal to be among 20 economists with the most favorable business environment. A certain set of measures has been envisaged, with the help of which we hope we will be able to achieve this goal. Of course, I mean here the reduction of administrative barriers, the greater quality of customs procedures, the reduction of import duties on many goods, including bearing in mind Russia's accession to the WTO. By the way, our Chinese partners, Chinese friends, have supported us throughout all this process and would like to thank them for that. That's why I hope that all these measures will be productive and our partners will feel that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Putin, I'm a, a delegate from a Chinese business. I would like to switch the topic a little bit. As we know that you are the um, uh, black belt, uh, grand band six uh, of uh, Ruda. So uh, we really would like to see that uh, there will be some uh, communications uh, between Mr. Putin and our martial artist in China, if you are visiting China one day. So our martial arts uh, have uh, uh, delivered their uh, well regards to you, and I think I've uh, completed my I'm glad that our Chinese friends ask this question. There is 1.5 billion Chinese. That's why in the, per in the percentage race, it's very correct that they're behaving in such a way and expressing such desires. As far as martial arts go, I have to say that, indeed, I'm a big fan of judo. I've s devoted almost all my life to this sport. And I think that our Japanese friends and my friends recognize that the four, the source of all martial arts are Chinese sports. In this context, the interest in my country and in other countries of the world to 
this part of great Chinese culture is very big. You have witnessed probably that when I visited China during my official stay there, I visited monks in one of the monasteries who traditionally have been developing these types of martial arts, and I have great respect and attention to this. Thank you very much for your question. I think the lady in red is not from China. She would like to ask the question. Let her give the mic, please. It's not known. Maybe she's from China as well. No, not from China. Hello, Mr. President. Uh, Diane Brady from Bloomberg Business Week. But I am going to follow up on the question from China because I'm moderating a panel tomorrow on health is wealth. And I'm curious about um, how you think Russia is doing in that area and what the priorities are for you and the challenges in terms of investments there. Thank you. It is one of the most important topics. I think it is very important for any forum, including this one. I believe that the framework of our discussions do not let us go into greater details or give more information on that, but many experts know perfectly well that major problems, the major challenges the global economy is facing result not from conventional reasons and not from the development of derivatives in the financial sector and unregulated nature of financial transactions, although this reason is quite significant as well and they accompany uh, this process as well. But the real reasons are more deep-rooted. There are many experts in the field of economy, many know Sergei Kondratiev, who in the 30s formulated the idea, the concept of long waves of crisis situations, and he came to the conclusion that the global shocks take place at the shifts taking place in technological old orders. Certain experts, including experts from my country, believe that now we are facing this global phenomena. We are facing the change of technological order, the shift in technological orders, and growing demands including those in the advanced economies where the golden billion lives, where people are used to overgrowing, outgrowing the other con con economies in terms of uh, consumption rates, uh, whereas ma many countries are living behind and they cannot sustain the same growth rates. Such people believe that the major reasons of this global shocks is in the in what I have mentioned. But the next technological order has to do with biotechnologies. We are shifting towards, we are turning towards this new order, but at moderate pace. Biotechnologies have to do with medicine, human capital, and health. That's why the substance you, that you have mentioned right now has to do not only with the fact that we have to combat flu, or some other diseases, well-renowned diseases with cancer diseases or diseases of the cardiovascular system. But the situation is much bigger. We have to move towards the new technological order where biotechnologies and medicine and the quality of uh, education of any person, health, uh, are important for ensuring high growth rates. If we take this, if we look at this problem from this angle, we will understand how important it is. Russia faced a number of problems that have to do with our transformation from plant economy into the market economy. It is a very painful process. Our reformers are being harshly criticized. Mr. Chibais is in one of the greatest representatives of such people being criticized. But still, uh, maybe it is justified, but they made one step forward 
to the creation of such a market. The same holds true of other areas. Let's say medicine, there was the great shift from command management in medicine, whereas new measures are evolving at a very low pace and people are being irritated with the inefficiency of this work. But one of the major tasks for us today is to achieve a new level of a new quality of medical services for our citizens. We have implemented a number of programs and another one more program has been initiated, modernization of healthcare. That's the name of this program. And here we speak about general health care in the regional scale. Uh, I don't want to bore you. I can talk for a long time about this problem. But our major task is to improve the material and technical resources of health care, to improve the quality of skills of people working in this uh, area and improve well-being of such people. We have worked on, at all these stages and we have to pay attention to biology and fundamental medical research. We pay attention to all these aspects of work. A special program has been created and it is complemented by the program of developing medical equipment, medical industry, national medical pharmaceutical industry. We are not going to be limited by our national borders, but it is, is not possible. But we have to develop it as well. Over the last years, we allocated around 186 billion rubles to develop pharmaceutical industry. We are going to do that together with uh, our foreign partners. And I would want my partners from the Asia Pacific region to get involved in this process. Thank you very much for this question. Dear colleagues, uh, we have been working for more than an hour. There is another question. Uh, please. And that will make conclusion.那个，呃，尊敬的普京总统先生您好，我是来自中国贸易促进会中小企业家，思想俱乐部的主席团成员，也刘存昆明加达利房地产公司的。我有一个问题想请问总统先生，嗯，因为今年参加了
call Euro. We remember the process from of moving from Eku to Euro uh, about uh, francs. The English men, the British have not abandoned their national currency yet. It's a very interesting aspect, but the steps towards the expansion and development in this area should be made. I agree with you. It is very right, very correct area of development, and I think it would be right if we at least mentioned tomorrow your ideas at the leaders' meeting of the APEC. Tom Fokin, Sergei. Tom Corporation, Sergei Falkin. You know, I have seven children, and they congratulate you. I congratulate you. Thank you very much. And I have two grandchildren. They ask me how and where will be well. When will our life be calm and and secure? You have said major areas of cooperation in the APEC: finan finances, transport, food security. But there is no program that could unite all the countries in this work. What advice could you give to the countries exceeding to the APEC region how to do it in the future? I haven't understood quite correctly how could they associate or correlate the, uh, your part of the story about grandchildren and their future with the another part of your question. Everybody is concerned about the future because my children will live in the 22nd century and for us it's high time to think about what will happen then. You know, to answer your question where it is better to live, I can say that in the modern world everybody can choose the place to live, the place where he or she feels more stability and interest, but the greater part of the population lives in their own countries. The movement to other countries, migration to other countries is a normal process, but not everybody is ready to do that. I do not hear you. What, what, is, what could be your advice? You know, I'm not a priest. What? <laughs> Well, my fellow banker is telling the best advice not to would be not an advice to your children, but to grown-ups in this room that are listening to us right now to follow in your footsteps. Have seven children. That would be the best advi advice to give. What advice could you possibly give to children? Love your country. Do everything you can for its development. Study well. Get good education. And think about the ones that are next to you. And enjoy life. The last question we have. Good day, Mr. President. My name is Keijal. I came from China. The food security is one of the topics of this, this year's APEC meeting. Um, but due to some reasons, as a drought in Russia and America, uh, you have pointed that, that over one, billion, one, million, one billion people in the world are starving. So I want to know that uh, as Russia, uh, um, a country with a high capacity of the green reserve, what steps and measures uh, will do? Thank you. Like I said before, you know, in the Soviet Union, they used to actually use more agricultural lands than in the today's Russia. But Soviet Union was not importer of foodstuffs. Even marine boats were technologically equipped in such a way to make sure that they accept grain. And they, were, they did not have the technical capability to upload grain for export. Well, in the today's Russia, for the first time ever, we started exporting grain. Not only that, we have become third and now we're second largest grain exporter globally. Well, that means is that there's great progress 
in agriculture. In some sectors of agriculture, uh, poultry breeding or bird breeding were made through breakthroughs. I can't think of any other country who would have achieved similar breakthroughs. And it's not my achievement, it's the achievement of our agricultural producers. And I want to congratulate them and thank them. And it's not the matter of percentage points. We've increased threefold over the past few years uh, poultry meat, bird meat. If five years back we used to import 1.4 million tons of poultry, last year we did not import any poultry at all. We are increasing production of pork or cattle, but to do so we need foodstuffs for cattle and birds. Of course, not everything has been done to develop agriculture to the desired level. In that respect, we hope to continue cooperation with partners. In the first place, I want to draw your attention to the fact that Russia is one of the richest countries in terms of agricultural lands. Please also note that in Russian legislation, there are no restrictions for foreign capital investments in any sector of agriculture, including uh, in growing agricultural products. So I hope that partners will be interested and will work in our agriculture as successfully as domestic agricultural producers do in Russia. One of the priorities in that sense would be developing social dimension of rural areas, improving health care, education in rural areas. I mentioned that because these are components that would help enhance productivity of labor. And that's what we're going to do. And of course, we'll employ advanced agricultural technologies and science. Final question, please. You, please. Hello, could I um, ask, just following on from that, I think it's apposite, and, um, and also, uh, Mr. President, you did mention right at the start of your address that you are negotiating a free trade agreement with New Zealand, and I'm from New Zealand, which is a small country, and just a moment ago, you also talked about <coughs> the technological advances that you hope to bring to agriculture. I guess in that context, my question is, how are the negotiations with New Zealand progressing, and at what stage do you hope to close the, what will be your first deal with, a, with a, another nation on the bilateral front? New Zealand is our traditional partner. I cannot tell you from the top of my head what the volume of uh, New Zealand products act, enter our market. It is substantial. Uh, it's mostly composed of agricultural products. I hope it will be expanded in the future as regards improving regulatory legal framework. Negotiations are on the way. I want to draw your attention to the following. It isn't a simple matter. Since we're not negotiating on behalf of Russia alone, it's the Commission of the Customs Union that is negotiating, and it is guided by the interests of the three states, Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. But I can assure you that Russian Federation and our Customs Union partners alike are determined to bring this work to successful completion, and I hope it will be done. New Zealand, once again, is our traditional partner. We need to find solutions to all issues that are impeding an FTA, and we're determined to do so together. As regards other countries we could cooperate with in similar fashion, all Asia-Pacific economies. Once again, it is a difficult process that requires ability to compromise, but we need and must find compromise. Thank you, Vladimir Vladimirovich. On behalf of all participants of Business Summit, I want to thank you for your 
very interesting address for being so patient in asking all the many questions. People that have gathered here have dedicated lots of efforts to the development of cooperation in the Asia-Pacific region, cooperation with Russia in particular. And we would like on our behalf to wish you every success in your work as president of Russian Federation. All the best. Thank you. Благодарю вас. Успехов.